Good evening, everyone. Vox Day, the dark stream, voxday.blogspot.com, and Infogalactic News. Um, sorry I haven't been around for the last couple days. Um, I've just, as it happens, been busy around this time of night. Um, last night I was actually on with Stefan Molyneux. Uh, we had a, a very interesting and and detailed conversation about uh, Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky. And I think that will probably be um, appearing uh, very soon, possibly as soon as tomorrow. It's been a busy, busy couple of days, I gotta tell you. Um, we're gonna be releasing uh, the second book in the Ames Archives by Peter Grant very soon. I don't know if you've read Brings the Lightning. I should uh, actually show you that one. Um, there it is. Um, Brings the Lightning is uh, Peter Grant's revival of the Western. It's a really good book. Um, we actually kind of styled it to look like uh, reminiscent of a, a Louis L'Amour book. Um, but uh, the, the sequel is called uh, it's set after the Civil War. Uh, Walt Ames, the, the lead character, is a, a Confederate veteran who can't stay, uh, stay around his, his divided hometown, so he goes out west. Um, so Brings the Lightning is the first book in the series, and we're going to release the, the e-book of Rocky Mountain Retribution um, probably on Wednesday, I would think. Um, it's already gone out to some of the the early reviewers, and um, and so we've been busy with getting that one together and getting that out, and then um, and then we're going to um, <laughs> we'll get to that, um, and then uh, we're going to be after that we're going to be releasing a book called No Gods Only Demons by Kai Wai Chia, and uh, that's kind of the crazy military sci-fi. Um, it, it, it's written by a, one of the guys who um, contributed a, a, a pretty cool short story to uh, There Will Be War, Volume 10. If, you remember, if you've read There Will Be War, Volume 10, you might remember there was a, a battle between um, the Chinese and the Japanese in space. Um, and that was, that was one of Kai Wai's uh, first, that, that was Kai Wai's first contribution. To our stuff, and we liked it enough that we talked to him about doing a novel. And so, um, I believe um, I believe Kai Wai is of uh, I believe he's of Chinese descent. Um, the uh, he lives he lives in Asia, so um, the uh, I always get stuff from like ridiculously early in the morning. So um, anyhow, some of you wanted to talk about. Uh, Asked me if, if I saw Mike Cernovich's appearance on 60 Minutes. I did. Um, as I, I may have mentioned, uh, I actually talked to Mike about it before it took place. Um, was it before it took place? Yeah, it was before it took place. Um, and, you know, a lot of people were saying, well, you know, why is Mike doing this? Um, he usually tells people not to talk to the media. And, you know, it's true that, I mean, that's what he says. That's what I say. Um, now, the, the, the answer to the first question is, um, you know, why would he do it if you say not to talk to the media? Well, first of all, you know, Mike's a, Mike's a big boy. Um, he, you know, he doesn't answer to me. I'm, I'm his publisher. Um, I'm his editor. Uh, I'm, I'm not his babysitter. And I'm certainly not his uh, media consultant. Mike knows more about the media than I do. And I, you know, I was, uh, Nationally syndicated, column, sent nationally syndicated columnist three times, uh, dating back to 1993 or 1994. So, you know, Mike knows what he's doing. As to why he did it, you know, I can tell you exactly why. Have you read Maga Mindset? This is Mike's uh, bit media manual. If you want to understand how Mike does what he does, or why Mike does what he does, read this book. MAGA Mindset. It's a very small book. 
much small, <laughs> much smaller than the stuff that I that I put out. Easy to get through. Um, yes, Stefan Molyneux did the audiobook for it. And there's a key phrase in there. And the phrase, I, I put it in the title, uh, too big to ignore. What drives Mike is very different than what drives you or me or, or a lot of people. You know, um, I will be too big to ignore is his mantra. And, and that is, is, is related to his goals and related to his, his objectives. And so when he makes a decision about something like 60 Minutes, it's whether that uh, helps him move closer to his objectives or not. Okay? So regardless, and here's the thing for, for Mike, regardless of how it turned out, whether it went fantastic and he looked you know, like a, a rocket scientist and he... And, and, you know, he, he physically vivisected the, the uh, Scott Pelley on national television and, and, and stood up and displayed his, you know, Pelley's bloody intestines before the cameras or whatever. Um, or whether, you know, he ended up looking like a complete ass. It was still going to, it was still going to, um, it was still going to move him towards his objectives. Because if you're on 60 Minutes, you are, by definition, big news. You know, 60 Minutes does not do stuff on um, minor figures. And so, um, and, and so you know, his goal in that is very different than, you know, if, if I went on to talk to 60 Minutes, I would want to be pushing an idea. I would want to be selling a book. 60 Minutes is not going to help me do that. You know, if you notice... Um, Mike was not on there selling his books. You know, he was not talking about guerrilla mindset. He was not talking about MAGA mindset. He was not talking about danger and play. You know, he was there to, um, he was, he was there to become, uh, a larger media figure and he succeeded in that. I mean, if you want to know why Mike went on 60 Minutes, all you have to do is look at the number of views that he had on his Periscope when he watched the 60, he, he watched the 60 Minutes interview while he was live on Periscope. That Periscope, I noticed just before I got on here, has 60,000 views. That's vastly more than, um, that's vastly more than I get than Scott Adams gets than than Mike usually gets, and so um, so there's a tremendous number of views there, and, and and so obviously he was very successful in his goal. Now Mike knows what he's doing. Yeah, you know, that's um, and, and what you have to understand is that when we are when we are he didn't look completely spastic. Don't be ridiculous. We've all actually seen this, you know. Um, and, and as far as the, the whole thing, the hour cutting down to two minutes, uh, you guys have to understand that is an absolutely standard operating procedure. You know, the, if you've ever read the interview with me with Wired, that was, a, that was three hours that she kept me on the phone for that piece of crap, where the stuff that she took out, the stuff that she um, put in the piece most of it had virtually nothing to do with what the interview was nominally about. Didn't even mention the book, SJW is Always Live, that was, was just coming out. Didn't, didn't even, he didn't even look at it. Um, <laughs> for the shirt. This is, this is the new shirt, by the way. This is the new version. Um, we, we, we fixed the SJW is Always Live shirts. They're a little bit... They were just a little bit off center, and um, and we added the we made the tongue red because it stand yeah the tongue is new the it stands out more. Um, there's nothing on the back of this one. On the back of the purple one, it actually has the three laws of SJW. So um, if if you want to know where you can find uh, these shirts, um, they're at crypto dot fashion, um, and or you can look under Dark Lord Designs.
Um, SJW is always down is going to have the exact same cover. It's just going to be green rather than purple. So um, only one tongue, I'm afraid. The uh, that would get a little weird with two. Um, but we'll make sure that it, it has the red. Yeah, that's very important. Um, but anyhow, the, the, the thing is, is that um, you, you can't compare the result of Mike's um, appearance on 60 Minutes with the various media appearances that Richard Spencer made. Okay, is anyone running to Donald Trump to disavow anything that, that Mike said or did? Of course not. I mean, no one, no one is even asking me or anybody else to disavow anything that Mike said because, because it, it wasn't about that kind of stuff. And so, you know, it, it, you have to understand that, I mean, when we offer advice to people, when I offer advice to people, it is not necessarily a absolutely 100% hard and fast rule for all people in all circumstances in all times, all right? If, when I say don't talk to the media, that doesn't mean that I'm not going to talk to Stefan Molyneux. It doesn't mean that I'm not going to go on the Jesse Lee Peterson show. They're media. You know, it's, it's shorthand for don't talk to the media on camera or you know, via video or audio where they can edit you and, um, and where they can um, use you to further the narrative. Now, I mean, it's the difference between dialectic and rhetoric, okay? Now, if you're going to get spurgy, I can be as pedantic as you want to be. I can go into as much tedious detail as you need me to go to make sure that you really understand every little nuance. But here's the point. If your name is not a recognizable name, and if you are not an absolute media adept, you should never talk to the media because you are not ready, because you don't know what you're doing. You don't understand how they do it. I mean, look, look at the people who are saying, oh no, um, they, you know, they, they tape record, they, they recorded uh, an hour just for two minutes. I mean, the mere fact that that might surprise you, the mere fact that you didn't know that that is how they always do it, means that, you know, you're not experienced with it. You don't know how it works. You know, you're going to get caught out. And, and a lot of people say, well, you know, um, I wouldn't get caught out. Um, you know, this, this person who talked to me, they're, they're nice. <laughs> they're always really nice when they come and talk to you. Hey, you know, I've been following your stuff for a long time. That's how it usually starts. I've been following your stuff for a long time. And, uh, you know, I think you really say a lot of interesting things, you know, and then if they're really smart, they'll refer to, you know, something in a, in a column from like five years ago, or they'll, you know, drop a couple quotes from your book or from your blog or whatever and say, you know, and, and uh, I, I really think you've got some, some really interesting and unique things to say. And, you know, we'd love to get your perspective on, you know, fill in the blank about this, whatever this hot subject is, you know, um, and, and it's a bait and switch, you know, because what they're really going to come after you on, like, for example, when, I mean, this was, he's a very minor uh, guy, but when David Pacman asked me to come on the David Pacman show, he, he asked me to come on, on the show to talk about Gamergate. Hey, you know, we had just, um, I think we had just done uh, Gigi in Paris. Uh, Gamergate was a, a pretty big deal. Um, you know, so it, it seemed, hey, here's an opportunity to actually talk about Gamergate. I mean, I, I legitimately thought that that was, because he had just done two or three pieces on Gamergate, and now here he was coming and talking to a genuine Gamergator about Gamergate. I go on there, and he immediately starts asking me about marital rape and asking me about a column that I'd written for WorldNet Daily something like eight years before. 
and uh, and then and then it was demanding that I defend a statement that I never made. It was a subtitle that the editor had written. Now it would have been a lot better if I'd been able to call him on that right away at the time. But of course, it was eight years ago, and I didn't write it. I didn't remember it, you know. So, so, but the point is, is that that is the level of deception that's taking place. Now, of course, Mike knew what 60 Minutes was doing. Um, <laughs> Cerno is not a total hypocrite. Don't be ridiculous. I've just explained that. Um, the, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, look, it, it, you have to understand when, when you say things like, well, Mike said never do the media and Mike criticized Richard Spencer for doing the media. And then he talked to the media. He's a hypocrite. You look like a retarded spurg. Okay. The train is fine. The Cernovich train is fine. All right. Just stop. Okay. The um, did they did um, did they know that he knew? Oh yeah, <laughs> they they were they were um, they had a pretty good idea, especially when he showed up in a suit. You know, they were hoping he was going to be a wild man and doing all that kind of stuff. And so, and he shows up in a suit. He's very controlled. Um, he doesn't get angry. He doesn't get upset. He stays very calm. You know, so it, it's, it's, um, uh, you know, it, 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 you have to understand, and here's the other thing that you have to understand uh, with television. Television is about the visuals, okay? It's, it's less about the, um, it's about the visuals and it's about comportment, okay? So the whole idea, the whole idea is that they wanted to pre pre um, present the, fake news and they wanted him to look like Alex Jones. They wanted him to look angry and disheveled and sweaty and and fit. that's what that's what the narrative that they were hoping for. And because of how Mike presents himself on Periscope, they thought that there's a decent chance that, that they'd be able to do that. Of course Mike's a smart guy. He actually cleans up pretty well. So he just shows up with his, you know, a fresh haircut and uh, a nice suit and a good tie and and behaves respectably very calmly um, and so that's why that's why it works so well you know that's why he was able to screw up their narrative and so um, but you know now would I have done it no you know if Mike had said hey Vox uh, 60 minutes has invited me to do this should I do it I would have said no you know um, I see all these things as unnecessary distractions. The, um, I don't care. I mean, honestly, I didn't know Scott Pelley's name until today. I don't pay attention to the mainstream media. I don't have any interest in the, in the mainstream media. You know, I mean, I will spend two hours talking with Stefan about a 19th century novel, but I won't bother spending five minutes talking to the mainstream media. And I don't care if it's the Wall Street Journal. I don't care if it's the New York Times. I, I get, I get con contacted by these folks regularly. Why would I talk to them? I have no interest in talking to them. You know, I mean, my, you know, I'll have to think about it when our books get to the point that I'm being contacted by, um, you know, the, the literary folks, you know, who actually just want to talk about, you know, the books or whatever, if they genuinely do, you know, I mean, you can usually tell what the person is after when you, you look at the name, you look at the byline, for example, the, the New York times, um, the New York Times guy who had contacted me, he's the reporter that uh, Trump had made fun of, the guy with the, the handicapped guy. Um, so I knew that he was a political guy, all right? 
Um, but you know, there are there are aspects. You know, the, the media is a is a, a a pretty broad spectrum thing, and so you know, if if I got contacted by someone from the New York Times Review of Books, sure, I'll talk to them because we're talking books. You know, if we're going to talk about you know, we, we've got some books that are legit legitimate literary news. Owen Stanley's The Missionaries is one of the best books and most important books that's been, or most important novels that's been published in the last 10 years. It's brilliant. If you haven't read The Missionaries, just go out, get it, do it, you'll thank me later. Um, I mean, I, I, we do not, as a general rule, we, we, we sign virtually no unsolicited submissions. Okay. Um, I, I took a, I took a look at this one cause I, I, yeah, it's on Kindle. Um, I took a look at this one and, uh, I, I decided to sign it by the time I, before I got to the second page. I think I was on like somewhere in the middle of the third paragraph. I decided that I had to sign it. I mean, it's, it's that good. Um, and so, you know, if, if somebody from some literary media wanted to talk to me about the missionaries, absolutely I'll talk to them about that. But it's very different because the they don't have a, in, in, in a case like that, they're not going to have a narrative that, that they're trying to use me to, to sell. They're not, you know, I'm not being used as a, a dancing monkey. So, um, anyhow, the, you know, I just want to make it clear <laughs> um, Louise has not talked to me since the election. I think she's hiding, hiding away from me because we had a bet and, um, she, it, it, the bet was that if, if Trump won, uh, she would have to read one of my novels. And if, if, if Hillary won, I'd have to read one of her novels. You know, she's a successful novelist. A lot of people don't realize that. And so anyhow, um, <laughs> I think she's terrified because um, a Throne of Bones is 854 pages, and so uh, I, don't, I don't know if she has the time to read it. So, um, the, uh, so anyhow, it, it's, um, <laughs> Louise is, uh, she's a character. Um, I have to admit, I, I genuinely enjoy talking to her, her every, every time I do. Um, I'm not entirely sure that she's always a hundred percent sane, but, um, you know, uh, I was in the music industry. I'm in the game industry. <laughs> um, you know, I, I'm not overly concerned about, um, people being, uh, you know, totally, uh, totally stable. Um, and I'm, and obviously, uh, considering that I was on wax tracks, uh, records uh, and TBT records. I'm quite comfortable, quite comfortable being around people that are are maybe a little bit uh, out of the out of the ordinary. Anyhow, um, but yeah. So so the <laughs> black box. That's right. Um, actually, it was kind of funny. The, speaking of the other black box, the the the, the dance group. Um, I heard this Italian song a, a few years ago that I quite liked. It was, it was this Italian rapper. And, but he was, he, it, the song was using a slowed down version of Ride on Time by Black Box. And I was thinking, hmm, that's kind of an unusual choice. I mean, like, why that particularly? But I didn't realize that Black Box were actually Italian, D, uh, Italian DJs um, who, who had, you know, recorded a couple of the songs. And so that was, um, no, it was, um, I'm trying to remember who it was, uh, uh, J-Ax, or, yeah, J-Ax, um, who's, uh, Iviketti Fano is the, is the one. So, um, anyhow, that's a <laughs> completely, completely esoteric and unnecessary tangent. Um, but, uh, so anyhow, uh, do you guys have any questions? Otherwise, um, I'm going to have to get back to my, uh, get back to my editing here. So if we're going to get Rocky Mountain Retribution out on time, um, the, uh, and we do, oh, by the way, we do have some new, um, I should mention as long as we were talking about the crypto fashion stuff, uh, we do have some new crypto fashion t-shirts now available. Um, we have some new, uh, 
we have, oh, Scalzi, yeah, sorry, I forgot about that. <laughs> um, yeah, for those of you who don't know, um, the uh, Dread Ilk uh, showed up at John Scalzi's book signing in Texas last night, and they actually managed to get him to sign a copy of SJW's Always Lie, which now makes it the rarest of uh, literary pepes. Um, it was pretty fun. I have to say, I have to give, I have to give Scalzi credit. Um, you know, he was a good sport. Uh, he knew, he, he clearly knew that he was in front of uh, an audience and on camera, so um, he handled it very well. I, you know, gotta give credit where credit is due. Um, and it was also, it was also pretty funny that, uh, that they asked him a question. They said, um, you know, he's got this 13 book contract. He's only delivered one book on it. And they said, so, you know, what do you think the over under is on your, on your contract getting, uh, your contract getting renegotiated? Um, and so, and personally, um, my over under on that is, uh, has been after between book four and five, it will probably happen. So, um, it may actually have now, now that, now that he's this, this first one, uh, <laughs> now that this first one has come out and been, you know, it pretty much bombed. Um, I would, I would tend to think that it's going to be more around book three. So. Um, but, uh, no, I mean, I mean, no, actually, I don't think that's, I don't think that's being like a cuck. I think that's the smart thing to do if, if you're, I mean, it's a PR situation. He's got a bunch of his fans around and that sort of thing. Um, and so it's, uh, it's the wise thing to do. Oh yeah. I mean, uh, this is the thing that, that people don't understand. Um, it's kind of funny, you know, I used to, you have to understand, I used to get accused of being envious of Scalzi quite often. And it was kind of bizarre because I, I would, you know, have been a published author. I'd published what, something like four books with Simon and Schuster before Scalzi had ever published anything. Um, so I wasn't in the least bit envious of that. Um, you know, his blog was a little bit bigger than mine. Um, but you know, and I did, I did actually like Old Man's War. There were a couple little things that bothered me about it. Um, three, three things specifically, but overall, you know, it was very Heinlein-esque. But see, what I didn't realize at the time, and, and this is something that Scalzi was very open about, what I didn't realize at the time is that he had written the book as an exercise in what he called coloring by the numbers. He would basically written it to try to make it as, as much a um, a, a, an imitation of Heinlein as he could. And so what we did not realize at the time, just having, you know, we had nothing else to compare it to, just had the one book. We did not realize that the good stuff in the book was ripped off from Heinlein and the bad stuff in the book was the genuine Scalzi. Now, you know, obviously, um, I mean, now that I'm an editor, people understand this, but I'm, I'm a very good reviewer. Uh, I was a professional game reviewer. I'm used to being able to break things down and analyzing things. I mean, it's something I have to do as a game designer all the time. And so um, what I realized when I started reading the second book in the series, that's when I realized, oh, okay, this guy is not actually any good. Um, he was just imitating, he was just imitating Heinlein very sla slavishly and it worked. Um, and then that was absolutely confirmed with, um, I think it was the Android's Dream, which was like, a, you know, the first chapter was a, a chapter long fart joke. It was just ridiculous. Um, I mean, just the, the, the idea that that was, yeah, and that was where his, you notice he hasn't attempted to imitate Philip K. Dick anymore because Philip K. Dick is a much more sophisticated author and, you know, Scalzi can't even, Scalzi can't even imitate him. And so, um, anyhow, so it was, it was kind of funny to, um, <laughs> It was kind of funny, you know, when, when my stuff came out, uh, you know, my, I started doing the fiction, the Throne of Bones and that sort of thing. It was kind of puzzling when people say, oh, you know, you're, you're jealous of Scalzi. I'm like, well, okay. Um, my blog gets more traffic. Um, he writes little 250, 300 page, you know, ripoffs of Heinlein or Asimov or any you know, H. Beam Piper or Philip K. Dick or anyone he can... He can try to rip off. Um, 
I write 850 page books that people are comparing favorably to George Martin. You know, um, A Sea of Skulls, people have actually begun comparing the series to The Lord of the Rings unfavorably, correctly. Um, it's not as good. But the point is, is that you can actually legitimately compare um, Arts of Dark and Light to A Song of Fire and Ice, uh, or A Song of Ice and Fire, and to The Lord of the Rings. It's, and it's a legitimate comparison. You know, it is probably better than the Martin and probably not as good as the Tolkien. Um, but it's not done yet, so <laughs> could go either way. Um, but, you know, uh, and so it, it's just, it, to me, it's funny to see, you know, I would, yes, he sells a lot of books. That's fine. But, you know, but the, the thing is, so what? I mean, you know, uh, id Software sold way more copies of Doom and way more copies of Quake, even though we sold six million copies of Rebel Moon Rising, and nobody ever, including John Romero himself, has ever said, you know, you know, Vox is jealous of John Romero and John Carmack. I'm not jealous of those guys. I admire those guys. I think they're fantastic, you know? Um, you can read my, I know, I know John Romero, I actually know both of them. You can read my review of John Romero anytime you like on the blog. Um, so, you know, um, in answer to your question, I enjoy writing fiction more and I'm, and writing, uh, writing political philosophy is much easier for me. You know, um, I mean, I, I wrote SJW's Always Lie in five weeks. Um, it took me two and a half years to write um, A Sea of Skulls, and I'm, I haven't finished the final version yet. So, um, you know, it's, it's just, I, I'm, I'm a much more natural nonfiction writer. Um, but what I've learned to do, you know, I mean, one of the great things about Castellia House um, and the editing at Castellia House is that it has um, helped me to improve my writing. You know, when I see the mistakes that John Wright or Peter Grant or, you know, Johan Kalsi or, um, or Kai Wai Chia are making, often I recognize that I'm making the same kind of mistakes. Or, or even if I'm not making the same kind of mistakes, I can see from their mistakes similar, you know, you know what kind of other mistakes that I'm making. And so that, that helps a lot. And, and, and people have said that, that my writing has improved considerably, certainly since the you know, War in Heaven and, and War in the Shadow days. Um, thank, thank God. <laughs> you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't like being... I, I, I knew that my writing was mediocre and I did not like that. And so it was, you know, I had to go through, uh, you know, I think it was Hemingway that said that you need to write a million words of shit before you can write anything decent. Um, I don't know that I got to, got to get a million, but no, um, I don't think that um, A Throne of Bones really needs much editing. We did a little bit of editing for the, um, for the hardcover, but um, I like, I mean, what a lot of people don't necessarily realize is that I like the slower pace. You know, I am not trying, I mean, okay, <laughs> I guess a sea of skulls begins with a, um, a, a sea of skulls begins with a pretty big bang. Um, but, you know, that's really not my style. Um, I'm not trying to be Larry Correa. I'm not trying to be, you know, uh, I'm not trying. I'm not trying to be Umberto Eco. I'm not trying to be anybody anymore. I'm just trying to tell. Uh, I'm just trying to tell the story the best way that I know how, and that seems to that seems to work better than um, you know trying to impress people with with literary chops that maybe you don't have. So. Um, you know, so it, it's, but, but it's a difficult lesson to learn, and, and it's something that actually that I had to, um, I didn't fully understand until editing uh, Corrosion, was because um, the, uh, oh, I see, <laughs> yeah, 
Um, the, you know, the, in corrosion, uh, there was this whole, like, the original draft, there was this whole sort of subtext. And it was getting in the way of the story. And, and I didn't realize it until I, I, I wanted to change the name of the, the, the servo character. And he said, well, you know, the name is supposed to represent this. And I was like, well, who cares? He said, well, you know, I've got this whole kind of subtext. It was just like, it was ridiculous. It, it didn't belong there. It got in the way of the story. And, and all that stuff is, and what I realized, and it was true of myself too, all it is is authorial vanity. It, it, it's trying to artificially add depth to your book so that you can convince yourself that it's it's great that it's meaningful that it's deep that you're a that you're a significant writer and it's all bullshit you know I mean I was Stefan and I were talking about that a little bit you know the whole like the significance of the color blue and things like that nine times out of ten it's nonsense you know, there, there's, there's no, you know, I mean, Dostoevsky cranked that book out, cranked it out. And, and he, ba and he took two completely different books and he basically crammed them together. Now, um, um, I don't think most of, uh, I don't think most of the greats really do. I think, I think most of the, um, I think most of the greats are just trying to, tell their story the best way they know how and and later readers and especially this is something that Stefan and I talk about later readers and especially lesser authors try to read stuff into it because and this is, this is very important to understand the lesser authors do so because they desperately need to believe that that the greatness is the result of hard work they want to believe that if they just put in the effort, if they just try hard enough, that they can do something that is as good as the greats. And it's not true. You can't. You know, and that's actually something that I learned from editing. You know, if if I if I tell John Wright to write something, he can send me something the very next day and it will be brilliant. Doesn't matter how long I, I spend I'm not going to do something as good, even if I take six months. It's just not going to happen. It's the same in music, you know. I can sit there, I, I can sit there with a bass and mess around for six months. You know, Paul Sebastian, the lead singer of Psychosonic, who's you know musically gifted, um, you know, hand him a bass and he'll have like six different awesome funky bass lines cranked out in about five minutes, and so. Um, I mean, talent exists, genius exists, um, you know, I am sad <laughs> that I, I don't have, I don't have much talent and thus far have not exhibited any genius, you know, so, um, what I do have is I have exceptionally high intelligence, which allows me to effectively simulate talent to a certain degree so you know but but we, we have what we have we are who we are um well no genius is, is accomplishment that's what that's what bothers me about you know people say oh you know you have a genius iq or whatever it's like there's no such thing you know there are people who are geniuses who um have iqs much lower than mine there are people who are have iqs much much higher than mine that are not geniuses and will never accomplish anything significant whatsoever. Um, percentile, um, I think for Native American, I'm, let's see, I'm pushing five SD, so. Um, but you know, it, it, it's, I mean, I'm happy, I'm, I'm happy and proud to have written SJWs Always Lie. But, you know, the, the best part, the best and and most brilliant part of the work is is totally unoriginal there's i mean it's 2400 years old all i did in the most 
and all I did in the most important part of the book was translate Aristotle into modern lingo. Okay? <laughs> that's not genius. You know, that's not, that's not talent. That's just explaining something. I mean, frankly, to me, it's, it, it's, it's, it's important, but it's not difficult. You know, liter literally anyone who read it and understood it could have done the same. And so, um, you know, Stefan could have written that chapter just as easily. Might have even written it better. So, um, and, but that's why it's important not to get carried away with, um, <laughs> I, I'll, I'll say, I'll say I'm talented at pattern recognition. Um, but, uh, that, that is a talent. Um, I've got, I've got pattern recognition and, uh, I can speed read. And I've, I don't have an eidetic memory, but I do have a, I do have an unusually good memory for things I read, which is kind of useful. But, but you know, again, th these are not, um, th th these things are nothing special. You, you can't put these things in the same category as, you know, the Umberto Ecos of the world, the Tolkens of the world, you know. Um, you know, and, 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 and SJWs always double down. It, it, you know, it's going to be interesting because the Aristotle section is going to be the sociosexual section. You know, there's going to be a section on the sociosexual hierarchy because we're having to delve into a little bit more into why SJWs behave the way they do, and of course that means we have to get into we have to get into gamma, and we have to get into into that a little bit. So it's it's I mean I. I think it's going to be a good book. I think it is going to be, um, I think it is going to be as good a book as SJWs always thought it was, and and if I'm able to do that, I'll be satisfied. Um, hopefully, hopefully it'll sell as well and be as popular. Um, but we'll see. You know, that that's the that's the interesting thing about books is you can write a book, you think it's great, and it sinks like a stone. Um, I have to say that I think, I, I, I cannot think of a single male SJW who is not a Gamma. I've, I've yet to encounter one. <clears throat> um, what am I proudest of so far? Probably my son's book. Um, you know, my wife likes to give me a hard time about how uh, he got a, um, he had a book signing in England before I ever did. I actually have a copy here. This was uh, this and last season's excursions. And what's remarkable about it is that um, he wrote it when he was, um, let's see here, four months after his sixth birthday. Um, so he actually started, and it's really cute because the, they, they actually published it with all of the um, grammatical errors and spelling errors, exactly as it was written. And, um, and what was fun is that they actually put the, um, the, the, the animals there. Those are, th those are his real animals, um, his, his real stuffed animals at the time. And uh, so it, <laughs> it's kind of funny because there's even, um, yeah, you know, the, the publisher did a great job. The, the, we did not publish this. This was long before my publishing house existed. So, um, but we are going to we are going to get this uh, republished, um, and, and uh, you know it's it's completely crazy. <laughs> but um, I've well, uh, my family. I've had family members do twenty three and me, uh, twenty three and me. So I, I know what all my my ancestry is. So. Um, yeah, that's that's his only book. He's 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 not a writer, um, and, and um, you know at least he, he isn't yet. I wasn't a writer when when I was his age. He's a he's a teenager, um, but uh, but that that I would say that that is probably. I mean, he was just so you understand. Um, he's the youngest male author to have ever been published, um, and so. Uh, that's something that I'm, that's something that I'm quite proud of. Um, in terms of, in terms of my, <laughs> I, 
I don't know. I'd, I'd, I'd honestly have to say that the, the accomplishment that I was proudest of in my life was probably scoring the third goal in the state semifinals against Minneapolis Washburn when I was a senior in high school. Um, the, uh, you know, um, even intellectuals can be, can be subject to the whole athletic glory days thing. But just in terms of, um, you know, the, the state tournament was a huge thing when I was in eighth grade. You know, when our, when our, um, when our team went to state and I was in eighth grade, um, that was, a, it made a huge impact on me. And so the fact that I had the chance to do it, it was soccer. The fact that I had the chance to make the state tournament, um, the fact that we were playing our absolute arch rivals and, um, and, and the fact that I actually managed to score what turned out to be the put away goal, um, you know, that was, that was something that, that kind of left its, its mark on me. And, and, and the thing is, is that things, but things like that matter, small things matter. Um, yeah, I remember 10 years later, I ran into my, uh, my team captain and he was, a, he was a real leader of the team. Um, and it was kind of funny cause, uh, we were talking a bit and he said, um, he said, yeah, he said, I'll tell you, man, you know, the one thing, the one thing we knew about you is that, um, you know, you didn't score a lot, but we, we knew that if, if, if we needed a big goal, you know, you, you would come through for us. And so, you know, that makes an, that makes an impression on you, you know, that, that, cause for, for men, it's so important to have the approval of other men. And I, you know, I was not a popular kid. I was, I mean, I was, I was always, you know, I was always kind of the weird, uh, the weird one that nobody understood what my interests were. Um, they didn't want to talk to me. I didn't want to talk to them. So the only place that I, that I belonged in a group ever was on the soccer field. You know, cause even with track, I was, I was a sprinter, but you know, it's not a team sport and I played tennis, but again, not a team sport. And so, um, you know, to be, to learn, you know, despite the fact that, you know, I was an introverted, arrogant intellectual, um, with nothing, had nothing in common with anyone to have this one thing where you could be, uh, tested, um, and, and, and accepted by the group. Oh, definitely McEnroe. <laughs> um, you know, that was, that was very significant in my development. And that's probably why uh, it was so important to me to be able to contribute to the team. And, and even now, you know, in my, in my soccer dotage, you know, I'm, I'm very old to be playing, um, even, even veteran soccer at, at the level that I play, you know, uh, my complete focus is what can you do for the team? You know, I've never played defense in my entire life until last season. Now suddenly I'm, <clears throat> I'm as often as not this, you know, starting right defender. You, know, you do what you have to do to help the team. And, and that, that tends to, um, you know, I think that's probably why, uh, you know, there's a, a lot of team spirit with the Dread Elk, with the Evil Legion of Evil, with the Castalia House people, because, because I, I understand that team is especially important to those of us who don't necessarily fit into groups very well. So anyhow, uh, I've now rambled on for nearly an hour, so I will let you get back to whatever it is you're doing and I will get back to my editing and I wish you a good evening. Cheers.